everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. We have a very exciting guest. We have Dr. Jenny Fitzgerald from Australia. She's one of the co-founders of the Australia Center for EFT over near Brisbane. Right, and she is also one of the co-authors of the Emotionally Focused Workbook for Couples. It's available on Amazon. It is a terrific resource, guys. If you haven't looked it up, make sure you get it. It's for your couples. But Jenny has, just has so wonderfully um, agreed to join us today to talk about obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. That's a big one. So thank you so much, Jenny, for being with us on the show today. Thank you, Annabelle. It's lovely to be with you. So can you tell us a little bit more? So let's sort of start off a little more general and talk about what do we mean when we say OCD? And let's sort of build from there, because that's, that's sort of a big thing in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Well, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, that's what OCD stands for, um, is a very disturbing condition that a person can develop where they become obsessed with thoughts, thoughts that are intrusive, thoughts that come into their mind uninvited, unwanted. And the, the thoughts, or sometimes it's an image or an urge, uh, can be very, very disturbing. And what the person often discovers is that they can neutralise or diminish the strength of that disturbing thought if they engage in some sort of behaviour. And the more the person engages in the behaviour, the more it becomes like a repetitive uh, compulsion. So the obsessive part of the title refers to the intrusive thoughts and the obsessive part refers to the compulsive uh, repetitive behaviours. And it, it, really does, um, it really does give people a, a lot of distress. It can be mild, but, but it, if the person has an, um, you know, a moderate or severe um, diagnosis, it will be a very disturbing condition. That's right. Some people have OCD so bad that they are housebound. They won't yes. go to public. It really interferes with their functioning. Yes. Now, do you have maybe any statistics about how, because we have a lot of couples that come into therapy and, you know, they kind of throw around the term loosely. And I know in those mm -hmm. cases that the client doesn't meet the criteria, that they're really just saying, oh, I'm OCD about this. It's become like this catch-all for I'm just persnickety about the way I like things. But how... Well, what's the well I think with those sort of people, <clears throat> um, what you might have there is someone with very mild OCD, or it may be that you have um, a person who has an obsessive compulsive, compulsive personality disorder. So this is more when, um, as you say, they're they s describe themselves as picky or uh, sort of um, rigid about how they like things in the house, tidiness and so forth. So the personality um, issue is, is more around the, these sort of folk are very keen on lists and rules and doing things an exact way. Um, and that often is at the expense of being flexible and open and actually efficient. There's, there's often a piece in the personality disorder that sort of gets in the way of efficiency. Even though for someone with OCP, personality disorder likes to say that their rituals keep them efficient, right? They're, this well, they, one's lists for their lists and everything has to be in its place because then I don't have to go looking for it. But then if you move it, you know, or you do something out of order, it's like chaos, right? Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. it can be. It can be. And it, of course, can be hard for the people they live with. Um, and it, it can really start to impair their overall functioning. You know, severe OCD often will interrupt people's capacity to work um, and, and have a, a happy life, really. It can be quite severe. And it really makes it hard for people to feel safe in the world, right? Indeed, it does, because their, their, um, their sense of heightened vigilance for danger is so 
um, like on full alert all the time that they're they're kind of watching for the for the triggers and uh, and, and that can really become very um, absorbing and interfere with um, all sorts of day-to-day -day activities mm. yeah now do you have any statistics or any idea of the numbers of how many people in the world are affected by OCD um, no, it didn't occur to me to check that out before you asked me to come on your program. Um, but um, it, there is certainly um, a small percentage of the population, um, 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 like all the anxiety disorders, um, and OCD is, is not the most common, but um, and certainly generalised anxiety disorder is probably more common. Um, and there can be social anxiety and specific phobia and post-traumatic stress disorder that are all fitting under an umbrella of um, anxiety disorders and um, th they certainly um, are, if you put them together collectively there, there's quite a number of the population affected but OCD specifically I think would be a, a smallish percentage and I'm sorry I can't give you the number. I'm sorry I didn't ask ahead of time it just sort of occurred to me as we were talking about it but so I like how you, you mentioned OCD, of course, falls under the umbrella in the DSM, obviously, for anxiety disorders. And can you talk about the anxiety aspect of OCD? Um, well, now that you've mentioned the DSM, I must just note that um, the DSM-5 has actually put OCD into a separate category, and it's oh. not listed now under sort of broadly anxiety but the the point is um the person feels very anxious so and and dsm4 used to have um ocd nestled in under the other list of of anxiety disorders um so i guess i whenever i think about OCD as being part of an anxiety disorder. I think of a beautiful person I had the a pleasure of meeting some years ago when I was a university student. We were asked to form a team, so th uh, two other postgrad students and myself, I used to go to her house to try to assist her to really do the therapy that was going to help her control her OCD. And um, I really enjoyed working with this woman. She was a delight. And I, I guess just being in close proximity to her as she tried to do housework and tried to cook a meal and tried to, you know, literally get the washing in off the line, everything would cause her extreme anxiety because the obsession, obsessive thoughts that she had were so strong and it would stop her for everything she was doing. She would have this, she you told me, the thought in her head would always be, is it right? Is it right? It was like this terrible doubt. And indeed, um, some people refer to OCD as the doubter's disease or the doubter's disorder. And um, when, when she would have these terrible thoughts of, is it right? Is it right? Um, then the urge would come for her to try and check everything. So something like, hanging the washing out on, on a, the line in the sun to dry would become difficult because it would be, you know, have I put the peg in the right place? Is the shirt sort of folded the right way on the line? And, and so she'd have to stop and check and check and check and check before she could go on to hang the next piece of clothing, for example. Um, and um, certainly <laughs> I, I didn't need any more convincing after I'd had some hours with her to see just how anxious and disabling um, that can be. Now, are these, so when these obsessive thoughts happen, are they, this obsession with these certain things, are they rooted in any kind of trauma in early life? Are there adverse childhood experiences that go along with this? Well, I, I, think, um, I think it's not, not easy to get just one particular um, risk factor for any of the anxiety disorders. I, I am, my understanding is that there's some degree of a genetic component that can be there. Uh, there's also the problem of the person having had 
um, abuse or neglect in their developmental years. Uh, and anything that has really taught the person the world can be a dangerous place is quite likely to increase their um, likelihood of developing um, an anxiety disorder. However, I'd have to say in that particular woman's case, so she had very lovely parents and had had a very nice uncomplicated life and it was a great mystery to her and I think to her psychiatrist who managed her really where it had come from. Um, so it's, yes, it's not, not always easy to just say, oh, there's a definite link right there. Now you, you talk a lot about anxiety and I know sort of in EFT, one of the ways we kind of conceptualize anxiety is just another word for fear. Is there a difference between anxiety and fear when it comes for, to someone with uh, OCD? Um, yes, I think there is a definite difference between fear and anxiety. As I understand it, all our primary emotions are given to us by nature to help us to survive. And fear uh, is an extremely important emotion that I think has helped us to survive across the eons of time in that it, fear is the, the is the emotion we get very very quickly it's very fast in response to threat in response to danger and um, fear we all know what it's like to feel afraid that raised heart rate and um, a tense feeling, maybe trembly hands, and uh, we feel very preoccupied looking at, at whatever it is that we've seen or heard that's uh, caused us the disturbance. And that that pump up with the heart, increased heart rate and so forth is all about getting ready to run and get out of harm's way, or in some situations to pump up with extra strength to sort of fight back and push the danger out of the way. So... That's fear, and it is definitely very useful. Um, we would call it an adaptive primary emotion. It serves a very definite function. However, my understanding is that anxiety is the term that, um, for example, Rackman, I like his um, definition of anxiety. I'll just read it. He says, anxiety is a feeling of uneasy suspense a tense anticipation of a threatening but obscure event. And I think that that, re that reminds us that for the anxious person, the source is actually elusive. It's not a clear link between a, a trigger and then I feel afraid, um, a, a trigger and then I'm, I'm anxious. That is much more uh, hard to... To understand for the and the person is often puzzled by their symptoms and yeah. um, that, that young woman who I mentioned just earlier she um, um, said to me when I was getting to know her you know I don't know why I have this because I have a lovely life and my husband's a beautiful man and is very good to me and I have lovely parents and I live in a beautiful area of Australia and I, I don't understand why I get these stupid thoughts in my head. It was for her puzzling. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't easy to explain. Yeah. So we, we would think in EFT of anxiety then being more maladaptive, as in not really helping us to be well and happy and have a good life. And in that sense, we class it as a, a secondary emotion rather than a primary emotion that has a lot of use. Right. So hang out there with anxiety i really love these explanations and I, I tell my clients i'm a recovering generalized anxiety disordered person <laughs> and you know to be honest i haven't met people who that have gad that aren't highly intelligent and highly successful i think if you're really smart and you're ambitious and you have a good head on your shoulders, you're gonna have anxiety because you know what's in the world, right? And you wanna be successful. And so that creates, you know, I love how you say that, that suspense, right? It's elusive. It's that, you know, maybe I don't really nail it down, but it's this worry that if things don't turn out all right, something bad could happen. If this party's not a success, or if I forgot to lock the door, or I forgot yeah. to do this, or, you know, and, and if you don't have anything to worry about, you can kind of drum up the fact that oh my gosh I got nothing to worry about shoot that that doesn't feel very good either 
Well, I think it's I think it's a good point you're raising in that um, a certain degree of vigilance for danger, a certain degree of watchfulness for something out of the blue happening that could be threatening for us, um, is is quite functional. But it, as I see it from a uh, like a therapist point of view, working. Yeah. With um, the clients, it's we want to help them have a functional amount of vigilance for danger, not right. an excess quantity right. of vigilance it, for danger. Um, anxiety can almost become obsessive, right? Almost like an addiction to worry, right? Well, it, can, it can become a habit. It can yeah. become a habit to worry. And um, I, I think it's just, um, you know, one of the real challenges of living in our world today, I mean, there's always been, across the eons of time, there would have always been something that you could be anxious about or worried about. But we do live in a complex world and there is a lot of things that do happen unexpectedly that can be alarming. Um, and so to me, it's understandable that we all need to, as you say, you know, lock the doors at night and, you know, be, live sensibly to protect ourselves. But I think... Um, to, to live a life that's um, joyous and productive and so forth, we need to be able to get that anxiety component un under wraps. <laughs> you know, we want to get it contained so it's not ruling us. And it becomes, I like how you say, so it's not ruling us because when it is in that level, it's hijacking our ability for joy yeah. and exactly. function. And it's harder to have as good of a life when you're constantly worried about when is the next shoe going to drop? I need to anticipate what that shoe is going to be so I can yeah. strategize and plan. Yeah. And I'm always worrying about that next shoe dropping. And, you know, I like how you mentioned in modern society, I think as technology has grown, all the advancements with everything kind of wrapped in your face all the time, it's just added more things to pay attention to, to worry about what could be coming from Facebook, from Instagram, from social media, from work email, from calls, you know, on mm -hmm. top of the chores of the house. I mean, there's just so many angles that we can be bombarded at. And, you know, just like, you know, anything, it, it crosses a line where it becomes from no longer functional and adaptive to obsessive, hijacking our joy, our ability to really have a good and healthy life. Yeah. Yes. Yes. One of, one of my couples um, a while back, um, I, I, I heard a comment the partner made that I thought was interesting. The woman has a tendency to some generalised anxiety and she's a very conscientious, hardworking woman and a mother trying to think ahead and prevent danger for her children and all of that good stuff. But at times um, he experiences it as stressful because she's wanting to say, and what would happen if, you know, if the, the tent the tent didn't go up when you were underway camping or, or, or whatever the concern might be. And, and he's, he said, well, I'd work something out. I'd figure it out. And, and that really, I felt in a way, was sort of a, um, epitomising the difference between their ways of thinking. He had a lot of confidence in his capacity to think on his feet and find a solution, even if it was, you know, maybe not quite ideal, but something that would be all right. And, and she was more wanting to protect against the possibilities of something going wrong. And again, I've said to this couple, you know, your children benefit from both of you. They, they need to be cared for and they need someone who predicts potential danger and tries to present, prevent it. But they're also benefiting from having a, a dad who can be confident and say, okay, well, if something goes wrong, we'll just have to figure out a solution. Um, yeah. That's really nice. And, you know, I love how you say that, that your one client's response really epitomizes, you know, that adaptability, that confidence in self, that secure base, right? Because an attachment, it tells us that when we have that secure base, that secure attachment, world. so even though we may be in a novel situation, we did Anticipate, we have that security that okay something may happen the tent may blow over or maybe whatever but I know that I'll be able to deal with it I know how to make best use of the resources so I I'm, don't walk around worried and obsessed with mm. what happened mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah, so it's getting the, the right amount of vigilance and the right amount of um, sort of paying attention to potential danger that seems to be one of what I think is one of our tasks of living in the modern world. Right. So now if a couple comes into us for EFT, now most of the time if we have a, client, a couple come in and one client have authentic OCD, usually by the time they're coming for couples therapy, they've already had an official diagnosis. But let's just pretend hypothetically that you have a couple come in and there's not been a formal diagnosis and you strongly suggest. How would you broach that? What would you assess for? Hmm. Well, I think what what would happen is, uh, well, it, I guess a number of things could happen, but one possibility I'm imagining might be that the the partner might start by saying things sort of obliquely. You know, it can get a bit stressful at our place or, um, you know, make some sort of reference to stress. And so I might say, so help me understand what goes on on a day-to-day basis between you both uh, in your home and little by little the, the the need the partner has to maybe check or to you know clean something 10 times more than another person might feel was needed um, will will come out sometimes of course the person with the condition may say oh I've I'm really in a bit of a bad way these days. I've got a lot worse and I have problems where I just, I can't go out without going back and checking all the windows are shut and the doors are locked and the stove's turned off. And, you know, sometimes I'm even out in the car about to drive away and then I think, oh, did I check the stove? So I get out and unlock the door and go in and check it again. And um, yeah, so sometimes people will be quite upfront. Other times they're more about embarrassed. There can be quite a lot of shame associated with any sort of behaviour that doesn't sort of fit the sort of norm. Um, so for them, I would be definitely saying it sounds like this is troubling to you. This this disturbs you, this dis- spoils your day sometimes. Would that be right? And if um, if the person with the condition says, oh, yes, it's I don't like it, I, I don't really know what's the matter with me, well, then I'd move to just saying, you know, I really think this is something that, that we need to talk to your doctor about as well and I would have been encouraging um, them to make contact with the doctor so that they can get a medical assessment. A- anxiety generally... Uh, can be aggravated by some medical conditions, things like thyroid disorder or pituitary uh, gland disorder. Um, um, Nutritional deficits can cause people to feel very anxious, not necessarily to the point of OCD, but with like a generalised anxiety. And and it can be a side effect of of, uh, medication. So I I like the work from a, a bio psychosocial approach to the care of all my clients where if there's something that I think may be um, biologically uh, you know, I'd get them off to the doctor and um, and that way then the doctor and I can hopefully work as a, a team to help help the person then to do well. Now and let's if, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and of course if the person actually has quite marked um, OCD, uh, I would be thinking they would need um, individual therapy that yeah. may, might run concurrent to the couple's support that I'd be giving them. Now, yeah. I'm thinking, you know, through the EFT lens, you know, when we're trying to treat a couple where one partner does have OCD or OCPD, I, my mind is already synthesizing it through attachment strategies. And I'm sort, and, and you tell me, Jenny, if, if this sounds right to you, sort of what I imagine is, you know, when these fears come up, they've turned, they've learned to soothe, to feel comforted by leaning on these compulsive behaviors and not leaning to their partner and asking for help and, and taking a risk to trust them that, okay, my partner's here for me. They're reassuring me I'm going to trust and let my guard down. It's really hard for them. And so they, they keep going back to the rituals. And in, in a lot of ways, we're helping them work on being more vulnerable and 
and expand their, their coping strategies from relying on self and these rituals to accessing a secure base or learning that there's a secure base they can access to help them feel calm when these thoughts may come in. So as I see it, um, what you're describing there um, would be lovely if that's what we, you might say, only needed to do. Right. Um, I, I am wholeheartedly with you that um, EFT is about strengthening the attachment bond between both the partners. But I, I believe it's important to note up front that some people can have terrible OCD and really still be living in a loving and reasonably happy marriage. Yeah. And it would be most um, inappropriate to sort of even hint that the, the, the client wasn't utilising the partner's help enough or that the partner wasn't trying hard enough. Often when people come to um, a couples therapist and one partner has um, um, like a bad GAD or, or an OCD, uh, they are often in a lot of distress because they've tried really hard for years to sort it and they're feeling worn out and wrung out and exhausted really from the, the strain. So uh, um, I, I guess the, the way I, he I think of attachment there is... Um, the, the person is likely to need medical help, maybe medication and individual therapy to help them work with, say, OCD or tendencies to worry if they have generalised anxiety disorder. But the thing that we can do as the couples therapist is um, help them over time to, to restructure their their attachment to restructure their their bond how how they do it how they connect with each other i like um i like this quote of sue johnson and andrea wittenborn they they wrote in one of their articles a while back that if a couple are securely attached they can usually uh, deal with pretty much any problem or difference but if they are insecurely attached, then any problem or difference can become a potential abyss. And I like that image of the abyss. I think that is what it can feel like for some of our really distressed couples who come in uh, with one person with a disorder and the couple have tried to deal with it and they have ended up feeling like they've just sunk down into this terrible abyss where they are, um, you know, caught in a lot of conflict or they're caught in a lot of um, cold sort of withdrawal from each other, desperately trying to, you know, cope as best they can but not really feeling close and safe together. Right. And I, so beautiful, I love that quote. Um, and when I, you know, when I mentioned before about, you know, sort of, synthesizing this through the EFT lens. It's not necessarily that the, the partner isn't trying hard enough or that they haven't dealt with it. I imagine by the time they come to us, they're exhausted from maybe I've been trying so hard to help soothe my partner's OCD or their anxiety and nothing seems to be happening. It's almost like in a way that becomes the content. And then, you know, again, you go back to the process. What happens when you try to soothe your partner? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. You know, what are, so how would we put this into the cycle when we're in stage one EFT? So before we would even be wanting to get into the cycle, to me, the first thing that I try to remind myself of before I meet new couples is that we are there to be a temporary attachment figure for them. And, and I think step one of the model helps us to assess and then listen for attachment themes. And it's a reminder to us to really start right from the very beginning, building a strong alliance. And, and so one of the things that I would I would do, particularly um, if a, a couple, say, with one partner with OCD, started talking about it early in, this, in the first session, I would like to um, look at the person with the OCD and say something like, my guess is you didn't choose to have these problems. They happen and they're really hard for you to deal with. 
and you don't choose to be checking or cleaning or whatever it is that the person might do to try and alleviate it and, and getting held up all day with these issues. This is really hard for you. So I like to make it very clear right from the beginning that I'm sympathetic to the distress and that it's not something they're doing to be difficult or in any way, you know, deliberate. And then I like to look across at the partner and eyeball the partner and say something like, and, you know, my guess is this is sometimes very difficult for you too because my imagination tells me it's perhaps hard for you to know exactly what to say or what to do that might comfort and help your partner and that this can then leave you feeling quite helpless. This is hard for you both. Yeah. This is stressful for you both and I want to help you to hopefully find a path forward. So that, that, that to me is sort of an important way to start so that both the person with the problem and the partner are not feeling like there's a bad person and a good person or a sick person and a well person, but two people trying to do their best but maybe having, um, you know, quite, quite a bit of stress in the process. And that really, I love that. That's really the embodiment of EFT is that relentless empathy that we're not looking at, you know, a bad person or a, or a, you know, disordered person. We're looking at two people trying the best that they can. And you're really building that therapeutic alliance, which is step one of EFT. Mm -hmm. You know, you're really joining with them with relentless empathy, right? And just being with both of them. And it is so beautiful. And as you said that, I just felt so good in my heart and my soul. And it mm -hmm. does feel so, so good as the client to feel like the therapist, really especially because you have to see both of them, you yeah. know? So you're really working to show up for both people in the room and you're really starting this off in a very beautiful way. And as I see it, really, every step of the EFT model, those nine steps that we have to work with, um, they all contribute to helping to restructure the couple's bond and to help them to feel more secure together. Um, and, and so I... You know, step two, you're mentioning about how do we go into the cycle. I, I like to be just really transparent and upfront with people and say, okay, so help me. What does this look like at home? What happens between you? And uh, I might, you know, say to the, the person perhaps with the OCD, it's not that you would have to start with them, but I might say, so when you get caught up in these, this checking or, or cleaning or whatever, um, what, what typically happens next? How do you feel? And then how do you feel can lead to, and what do you then typically do, the behaviour? And, um, and that starts us looking at the steps of what the, the distress is like for, say, for her, not that it's only women who can have OCD, um, and, and then I might look across at the partner and say, and so then when she does whatever, what, what happens inside then for you? What, what feelings are there for you? And partner might tell me and then I'll go, okay, that sounds like that can be perhaps frustrating for you or maybe at times you're saying you feel helpless, you don't know what to do. And then... I'd like to link the, the emotion to the, be, the next behaviour. So I'll then say to him, so when you get that helpless feeling, what, what would you typically do then? What, what, what would she experience? What would she be seeing you do or, or sound? What, how would you be sounding? Um, and, and so little by little, we can construct a, um, the, like the infinity loop uh, where we help people to get a sense that I feel... I behave, my behaviour affects how my partner feels, my partner then behaves in a certain way that comes back to impact me and this is how we can get stuck when it's a negative loop. We can help each other feel great if it's a positive loop but it can be um, a, a very bogging place if, if it's all negative feelings and negative um, behaviours. And I, I think the... Um, you know, the, the rule of thumb with working with the cycle is that we're encountering usually, for a start, a lot of secondary, not so useful emotions. And so we need to do a lot of validating, 
a lot of just meeting them there with, you know, statements like, yeah, you get frustrated. Of course you get frustrated. That makes sense. You didn't ask to have this problem and it's, it's a big problem and it would make you feel very frustrated. And I'm not then going on to say, and I think it's a good idea, you try to stay frustrated for the rest of your life. I'm just meeting them where they are in the moment, validating the, the legitimacy of their struggle. And um, over time, then the work with the cycle is going to uh, move to more actively helping people see that some of these behaviours can be interrupted, that we don't have to just keep doing, not, I'm not talking about OCD stuff, but the tension that goes on between the couple um, is something that they can learn to interrupt. And that's what I'm here to do, to help you interrupt it. That's the sort of talk I like to have. Yeah, that's beautiful. And so can you give us an idea of what the escalation might look like for a couple with OCD? Well, if the OCD um, has been quite severe, like the thoughts are really intrusive and the compulsive behaviours are very um, entrenched, um, I'll, I'll just reiterate what I said before. I think it's quite likely the person would be needing some medical treatment, medication and, and individual therapy. But as the couples therapy progresses, um, what, what I think can happen is that you get a nice intermingling of change where, um, let's say, perhaps some of the severity of the OCD is maybe now being a bit more responsive to treatment uh, that they're having individually and then the couple are starting to see that they can get caught in this terrible tension around some of the, the OCD behaviours and of course around lots of other things as well. You don't have to have OCD to end up um, having an argument with your partner. Um, and, and and so de-escalation, um, I, I love it when couples come back and I say, so how have the last couple of weeks been? Oh, well, hmm. and they're a bit quiet for a moment and I say, so what's been happening? And they will say, well, it's been a bit better actually. And, of course, it's tempting to say, oh, that's good, right, well, let's move on. But instead, actually, we have to do the opposite. I, I like to pause there and go, okay, a little bit better. That's interesting. Tell me about it. How has it been different? And um, that way the, 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 they are helped to sort of slow down and look at what did each of you do to help this week or this two weeks go better? And, you know, one part might say, oh, well, um, you know, I've been conscious that when I get cranky, it is sort of pretty upsetting from a partner. So I've sort of been trying to keep that a bit in check. And, yeah, well, um, he's been calmer. And, you know, they start to sort of gather a little list of, of um, things that they have both done that's contributed to a, a, um, a, a lessening of the, the ferocity of the cycle. I love that. And and I think so much in EFT that some therapists heighten sort of the, the negative dance, but they don't pause in between and heighten the positive dance when they start to take positive movements. And when we can slow it down and really zoom in and heighten those positive experiences, mm -hmm. those new moves that they're doing, the better, the steps that they're making towards each other that can also have a really powerful effect on, oh, this is what doing good looks like. This is what yeah. having a great relationship looks like. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that's a good point you make. It's, it, it's incredibly important that we take notice of, of all the little tiny steps of change because people don't usually, well, you can occasionally get a couple who listen to you once talk about the cycle and they go home I have encountered this, I think, probably twice in my whole career where they came back and said, 
oh, we thought about what you were doing and like, that's terrible. We don't want to do that anymore. And it's like they have a de-escalating event where they sort of dive down into a different place. But the majority of people don't have de-escalating events. They go home and get caught very quickly, sometimes in the car park outside of your, your clinic room um, in, in some sort of in negative interaction. So it can be um, that they, it's their day-to-day -day life of living with it and seeing how so many times they say and do these things that trigger the partner. And as they start to really see that and, and take some steps to interrupt it, they then start to de-escalate. And that's then where the therapist gets the weight behind that momentum for change and really helps to affirm it and applaud it and celebrate it and um, you know, help, help them feel in, enthused to, to keep going, to improve things. Now, I just thought of a really interesting question just popped in my mind as you were talking. And I'm thinking of, okay, so, you know, we're heightening the, the small steps that they've made, the, the positive steps, the way that they're starting to change their dance together. And we're going to start moving into stage two. Now, in stage two with the couple that has OCD, I was thinking, boy, do you, does OCD fall more along withdrawers or pursuers? Who, who do you, if it's withdrawal re-engagement, that maybe not necessarily mean you're starting stage two heightening with the person with the OCD? Well, I think you, you definitely have to have de-escalation occurring quite sort of solidly um, for a couple to feel safe enough to start talking um, at, at a deeper level about their needs, about their fears and so forth. Um, I am not sure that I would want to comment as to whether the OCD person might be more likely to be the um, pursuer or the withdrawer in the relationship because I could imagine it could work either way. Um, if, if they're very shame-ridden, um, they, they may well become much more withdrawn and sort of stepping back and saying things like, oh, you know, I don't deserve to have you love me and, you know, all that sort of really um, more withdrawing negative behaviour. But, but sometimes uh, people with anxiety generally, like a generalised anxiety disorder, for example, uh, they can be quite irritable. That's part of the symptom of anxiety. And so it may well be that they come across to the partner as critical and demanding and um, picky and so forth. So um, e either way, um, you, you would be wanting the... the couple to have a good sense of understanding how they have irritated each other in the past and got caught in these loops and how they've got out of it by being able to step back and let go and 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 not react so quickly um one of the one of the little tips you know in eft we like to offer to couples is to find a nickname for their negative cycle and um you know some people might one couple i know recently called it the terrible two-step and um and then, and I remember a, a, another couple called it the ugly sinkhole, and and they t they told me that over time, they one or other of them only had to go oh like this with their finger oh don't let's do the ugly sinkhole, and they'd stop, and have a bit of a laugh, and it helped them really see that they didn't have to just go down that sinkhole every time that they had a, a capacity to to stop and do something different which is which is really very empowering for people i think you realize they're not they don't have to stay completely um, caught that's beautiful i love that so i hear you saying that you know, it's not necessarily particular to a pursuer which are could be either mm -hmm. and of course you know, we want to make sure we've achieved full de-escalation, built that scaffolding, emotional scaffolding, so that clients feel safe to go deeper in stage mm -hmm. two. And of course, stage two starts with withdrawal and re-engagement. But in general, can you give us maybe a, a, a little snapshot about what stage two might look like with a couple with OCD? Well, I think um, stage two is really where some very beautiful deeper work happens and the therapist doesn't 
usually know what's going to be said. I um, mean, we might have some idea of what's coming, but um, often it can be that, that either partner can go to a much deeper, more vulnerable place and start to share about things that they've perhaps never talked about before. I think when, when a, a couple are doing battle with a common enemy, such as OCD or it's very bad um, generalised anxiety disorder, um, the, the partners who are often withdrawn, they can be more withdrawn because they feel like they're being blamed for um, n not understanding enough or not doing enough to help and so forth. Um, they, the, the, the partners often struggle with the sense of, I just don't know if I'll ever get it right with husband or wife. I don't know if I'll ever really be able to support um, my partner in the way that she or he wants. And, and so this is, I think, in stage two, where some of these more more vulnerable expressions it's not just the cranky oh i can never please you and like that's stage one stuff but one, once we go down into stage two we more hear things like you know i really i really am starting to wonder well, will i ever be able to really help her the way like i do want to but i don't know that i can um and you know in a case like that I would be wanting to use the power of enactments where the change happens, getting um, that person, let's say it's a man, um, disclose that to his, to his partner, talk about, you know, how that feels to feel like, you know, he just can't sort of get it right or he doesn't really know how best to help her. And sometimes... Um, not always, but, but you know, with a de-escalated couple, um, you then hear some amazing responses. Um, the partner, you know, might say something like, you know, you've never spoken to me like this ever before. I, I've never heard you be so willing to be humble about what you don't feel you're good at or what you can't do. And... And then some, some of the next bits that come um, absolutely amaze me too. Statements like, you know, I don't expect you to be perfect. I don't expect you to have all the answers. You, 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 you know, you can't just sort of take away this problem with anxiety that I'm trying to overcome. I, I don't expect you to be perfect. And, and that, that type of talk can be extremely relieving uh, for the partner who struggled and tried and wanted to be helpful but hasn't really kind of measured up. And then over time, you know, I, I'd be then wanting to really process an enactment like that. So how was that to hear your wife say that you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to always know what to say? And partner sitting there going, ah, oh, well, it's a relief actually. It's, yes, it's good. And then sometimes from there with the relief, comes but I am sorry that I haven't been more helpful and we you know get that into another enactment and how's this for you partner with the anxiety to be hearing him say how sorry he is that he hasn't been able to help more and um, again she might reiterate um, that it's it's special in and of itself just to hear him share so vulnerably and um, yeah that's a, that's a sort of beautiful um, sort of yeah you know it's it's not a lot of words but they're powerful words what are expressed because it's coming from a place of um being heartfelt and and then over time with those sort of couples um i like to help the person who's convinced that he's not helping enough discover how he actually is helping at least somewhat you know we sort of try to explore that and and i get her to um, articulate the things that he was already doing that is helpful and so forth. Um, and, and then over time also, I think as the couple's confidence grows, they, the, 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 the person, the more vulnerable partner with the anxiety issues can be helped to start to voice what they need and what they picture would help them in moments where they feel really vulnerable. And, and, and the whole goal of stage two I guess is to help um, the more withdrawn partner be more engaged and the more pursuing partner to 
be able to be soft in how the needs are talked about um, and um, you know um, I, I, rec I recall a couple it comes to my mind where the um, the, the fellow, it was the classic male withdrawer, a female pursuer, and the female had a, a, quite an anxiety issue. And, and, and he used to sit there more than one session in a row saying, oh, I just don't know what to do and, and I feel for you and I feel bad and I don't know what to do for you. And one day she quite confidently piped up and just said to him, you know, if you could just say to me, when I'm starting to get all, and she had some funny little term for describing how when she was sort of agitated and anxious, if you could just say, well, how can I help you right now? What would be the best thing to do? That'd be great. That, and he went, what? Just that. That's what you want me to do. Oh, I could do that. And, you know, then it starts to sort of demystify this whole process of loving support and turning to each other. It's it's not rocket science. It's goodwill and love that the partners are looking for. Yeah. It's not rocket science. It's attachment science. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. I love that. Exactly. I'm really describing is that the process of stage two with a couple of OCD really, in a lot of ways, isn't different than stage two with any other couple. The, the OCD or the anxiety may be an extra special way that they get caught up in the cycle or um, that might murky the, the attachment needs, you know, but, or the vulnerability, but at, this, at the same end, you know, EFT is the same process, different couple, yeah. right? That we're leaning into those vulnerabilities. I like you use the word humble, which is really neat. Mm. And it's, that really is like, you know, another form of vulnerability is a beautiful word. And it's nice to add that to the Rolodex. And, you know, you're really talking about how teaching the couple how to lean in and help each other when they get caught in these places, but in a much deeper, more profound yeah. way. Absolutely. Starting to reach and rely on each other, which is a hallmark of secure attachment. And really, I think the, um, the words that I like to keep in my mind in stage two is simple, soft and slow. Um, we do not need to make it complex and difficult. This is not a time for great, you know, profound analysis of needs in an academic sort of way. It's um, helping people to simply and softly and in a non-blaming way be able to slowly look at what really are the core issues for them and what are the core needs in the relationship. And when they're able to, um, well, the model tells us, when they're able to reach for each other and talk about needs in a non-blaming way, when they can both do that, um, the couple have a, a security that they didn't have before and it will take them a long, long way. You just have a beautiful way of saying all this stuff. It's so eloquent. It just it just fits, and it, it just sounds so good. And I love I love listening to you talk about this and the way that you describe secure attachment for stage two is really quite beautiful. And and I'm just really blown away by how wonderful you are. And so <laughs> so Jenny, tell us you're in Australia, um, but of course you know trainers. There's their planes and sub trainers can fly around and and teach trainings. Can you tell everyone about your trainings, your websites, maybe other material you published? Um, yes. So um, I thank you. Um, I have um, published with Veronica Carlos Lilly the um, the little book that you mentioned at the beginning, an emotionally focused workbook for couples, the two of us, and uh, that was a very positive experience uh, writing that with her. And uh, we we sell it, and um, a lot of couples have have given me positive feedback that it, that it seems to be helpful along the way. It was written as largely an adjunct to couple therapy, a sort of companion for the journey. Um, I also have edited a book that Routledge published a couple of years ago called Foundations for Couples Therapy, uh, Research for the Real World. So it's, uh, as, as I say, an edited book. So I invited a lot of people all over the place, North, mainly North America, but also within Australia and Britain, to um, contribute chapters that I 
I decided was useful information for a couples therapist to know about. So as I mentioned, um, that book, that makes me think of an, a lovely chapter in that um, that was written by um, Latia and de Villa, two uh, academics in North America who have... Um, specialised in the idea of working with mental health problems and couples. So they have a, a lovely chapter in the book on um, um, the, the, the specific issues and difficulties that can be there when there's depression or anxiety or whatever uh, for one of the partners. So that's just a tip for people who might like to, to read some more. Um, and also, while I speak of um, reading, I do want to draw attention to that lovely chapter in the Emotionally Focused case book that came out in 2011. Uh, Wayne Denton, a psychiatrist who has done research with um, Sue Johnson, Wayne Den Denton and Adam Coffey wrote an excellent chapter in that about how to modify EFT when one partner is depressed. And so I, I would think it's very, it, it has a very similar sort of pointers to the sorts of things you and I have been talking about today. So I teach EFT and the externships and core skills and sometimes some specialty topic and one day workshops um, all over Australia. I, I'm, I have had a goal to try to teach it in every state and territory and I'm, I'm nearly there. Um, I'm going to South Australia at the end of this year, which will be the first time an externship's been taught there. And I have a booking made for Tasmania uh, for next year for the first internship in Tasmania. So that will be feel like a bit of an accomplishment. Um, yeah. well, if, if people are interested in maybe, um, maybe your listeners are in Australia, so they can go to our website, www.aceft, that's the Australian Centre for Emotionally Focused Therapy, .com.au and all my um, training is listed there and of course um, some of you uh, some of your American listeners or Canadian listeners might fancy a, a holiday in Australia and, and they could slip in and do an externship or course skills with me as well so we're absolutely and they could contact you to have you come teach a specialty class in the states right well that would be lovely if it suited the person who's training in that area yeah um, can you yeah. give us that of the specialty topics that you cover? Uh, well, my PhD research looked at hurt in couple relationships and the repair of hurt and how um, how education, psychoeducation can help uh, couples to get skills where they are able to reach for each other more and mend the hurtful um, damage. Uh, so I, I do... Uh, workshop on infidelity that's um very much drawing on that that sort of research which i rather like i i find those couples um very very interesting to work with it's challenging their distress is high but they some of them can make amazing steps forward in terms of repair it's very heartening to see mm. that's amazing so if folks want to find you they can go to aceft.com.au that's right yes put the description for that i'll put the web address for that in the description for this video on youtube and do you have a personal website as well no no um i'm part of the aceft uh, website. I have a lovely colleague, a co-director, Claire Rosman, who's now a trainer in training. And um, sh she and I have all the activities of our, our with our associates and so forth, and the training that I do and that she'll be doing in the future uh, on that on that website. Excellent. Excellent. Well, so guys, I'm going to put all the information, including links to Jenny's books in the description for this video on YouTube. And make sure if you haven't checked out the workbook for couples, it's available on Amazon. And it is an incredibly helpful tool. I assign it to my couples. I have them do like in between their couple sessions, they'll say, okay, this week you're going to do chapter two. Then the next week we'll do chapter three. You'd be amazed how it helps them do the work outside of session, helps them understand their cycle. And sometimes they can't even get through the homework because it brings up such good stuff. And it's like, okay, let's talk about that. What happened for you guys? So it's really phenomenal. And it's, it's just a terrific aid. So make sure that you guys check it out. It's on Amazon really easy read, very digestible, and it's great. So 
Thank you again, Jenny, for being with us and just, just for your tremendous wisdom. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, Annabelle, a real pleasure. And I hope our listeners will get some benefit from that because it can be a challenging topic, um, but one where EFT brings a lot of riches in terms of the healing that it can bring about. Mm. Yeah, and this, is, this was a topic that was specially requested, so I know that everyone's hungry for this, so I'm excited to uh, release this video. And guys, just make sure that you hit subscribe because more episodes are on the way. Wonderful. Thank you.